Welcome, everyone. Um, this is Diane Tom. I am the CEO of Alta, and I'm really excited to be with you all today for our virtual advocacy summit. As many of you know, this is our second of a series. And um, today we're going to be talking about conducting closing in a COVID-19 world. Thank you so much, Diane. What a very nice introduction. I'm not sure I can live up to that, but I really appreciate it. Good morning. <laughs> Good afternoon and good morning to those of you who are on the West Coast. Um, I have with me here today my fellow Alta board member, Maureen Pfaff, WTP NTP from Washington State, the president and CEO of Olympic Peninsula Title. I also have Randy Gilbert from Florida's Title Insurance Company. Randy serves in what a role, I wish I had this role. It's his role as Chief Happiness Officer. I love that. And then I've got Tyler Newland, Digital Closing Implementation Specialist at Pioneer Title Agency in Arizona. Finally, we have Steve Gottheim, Senior Counsel at ALTA. Steve will be joining us later in the webinar for Q&A. So be sure that if you want to submit questions, submit them through the question box on the top of your screen or email meetings at alta.org for your questions. We'll be happy to address those in the Q&A session. But we're going to do this today. We're going to talk about how we're all kind of functioning in this um, new world of, uh, of coronavirus and the, the various um, ways we can still conduct business. Um, and because we've got a great um, variety of people from all over the country, we should be able to get some good information. But please do submit your questions to us. So without further ado, I wanted to start off and, uh, and get the speakers talking about it, because I know that's why you're here. You're here to hear what other folks are doing, get suggestions. Um, or information to help you in your business. So I want to start off with um, with uh, Randy and see how things are going down in the Sunshine State. What percentage of your closings, Randy, are are Ron or Ren? Um, Ren being the remote ink signed notarization, I think is what the acronym stands for. Ren um, or drive up. Kind of talk us about talk to us about how you're doing closings down in in Florida, Randy. All right, so <clears throat> Florida only enacted RON in January 1st of 2020. So now uh, we joined a bunch of states that already had it. But for us, the latest in prop tech, in other words, technology and property uh, for title insurance companies is this uh, remote online notarization. And with prop tech, it used to be about ease and convenience. But ever since COVID-19, it's been more about the safety, health, welfare, and uh, <clears throat> social distancing. So Ron has brought on a new, whole new uh, purpose. The, uh, so that's really what we're trying to push uh, is the safety, the health, the convenience, and the social distancing. Uh, we don't do any WIN, which is the remote uh, ink notarization, because uh, that's, that's not allowed. In other words, uh, where uh, somebody will ask uh, somebody on Zoom or, uh, or Skype to show a document remotely, and do a closing that way, and then they'll notarize it when the documents are mailed back. That's that's not allowed in Florida, so we don't do that. Yeah, is it allowed? So, Maureen, how about you? Is is Ren permissible in Washington? I know Ron is. Well, we are kind of in the same arena. Our Ron rules, well, our Ron law was voted in last, late last year, but the rules weren't going to be put into place until October of this year. So we are currently working under an emergency order that allows for Ron. But I have to say, um, our company has done a grand total of one Ron transaction. Although we were very excited to finally do our first fully digital closing, um, we just aren't seeing a lot of requests from lenders for this. And our local lenders are not yet ready for fully digital closings. So we're really focused more on um, using DocuSign to get as much of the signing out of the way and really limit how much time we're spending with our clients. So we're doing a fair number of curbside signings in our parking lot. And then we also have installed plexiglass screens on our signing tables in our two offices. So uh, for those that have to do a full loan package, we're not doing those in the parking lot. We're, we're bringing people in. Um, but again, it's mostly, it's, sanitize your hands as soon as you come in the door we walk you straight to the signing room we give you your brand new pen and you take it with you of course and um, we're really trying to keep people 
down to the minimum amount of time we have to spend face to face for their safety and the safety of our staff. I would love to be doing a lot more, Ron, and we really haven't even dealt with RIN. Um, that's so new. I haven't honestly even looked into it, whether it's permissible in my state or not. And it seems Randy made a comment the other day about, you know, if you get past all your Ron laws, RIN seems like a huge step backwards. And you know, right. so I'm just focused more on Ron and uh, DocuSign. Tyler, what about you in Arizona? I know you've got Ron there. Um, uh, anybody doing rent closings? Any, you know, how's that working? Or what are you, what are you doing? How are you doing the most of your closings? Sure, I don't know anybody that's doing rent in Arizona. Um, our executive order gave an early implementation for our Ron statutes, so the folks that are moving forward on digital are going with Ron. Uh, we've got offices all over the state, and so in each of the different communities and each of the different office makeups, there's a very wide variety of of the different comfort levels from our customers and, and our folks on the ground there. So we've really just tried to empower the folks in the office to decide what the best approach is kind of per transaction. Um, so we're doing the uh, the health screening questionnaires. Uh, we're doing drive up closings in quite a few of our branches. Quite a few of our branches are still taking on in office signings with you know a twist, designated signing rooms. Um, yeah, there's one of our, uh, our plexiglass screens there on the left. Um, and then we do, we have been closing RON transactions as well. We're probably doing four to eight RON signings a day right now, and that's ticking up pretty quickly over the last couple of weeks. Um, several months ago, we went ahead and started signing up with the RON vendors, uh, knowing that August was coming and we were going to get the RON at some point. And so we wanted the experience on the technology and, and start figuring it out. Uh, a lot of the thought that goes into whether or not we can do RON on any transaction is what's being signed. You know, a, uh, an affidavit of disclosure is different from an acceptance, is different from a warranty deed and a deed of trust, and they each have their own little unique quirks. Um, so we, we're very careful about what it is that, that's getting notarized uh, electronically and how we're going about doing it. Um, you know, if it's something clearing up a piece earlier in the chain, uh, underwriters were willing to make you know, uh, special exceptions to allow those through um, using out-of-state notaries. Uh, so all, all kinds of different things have come up. Owners affidavits, uh, marital service, all kinds of stuff that aren't necessarily a warranty deed and a deed of trust in an email. We weren't necessarily going for the holy grail of, of full digital closings. We were just trying to get practice with Ron earlier, um, which seems to have really helped us out in the last few weeks. I was going to say that was really probably a great, your staff was probably a lot more prepared than other folks because been practicing it um, and then have to put it in place sooner than you expected. Um, you were probably yeah. better to do that, which is great. So we don't have RUN or RIN allowable in South Carolina. Um, and we are doing strictly drive up closing. We're not letting people in. Um, we're doing, um, we, you know, send the packages out to the buyers and sellers ahead of time, call them to review all the documents over the telephone. And then when they come in, they essentially, um, they stay in their car and one of our lawyers goes out to the parking lot and signs, you know, has them sign just the signature pages. So logistically, it's a lot more. We only have a few people in office. Um, we have about seven people in our main office and everybody else is remote. Um, and so logistics are tough because everybody else is remote. You're trying to get packages in organized, emailed out, and then signature pages pulled out, put back in. So the logistics of doing that are, are pretty um, pretty intense, particularly on a, on a heavy closing day. Um, anybody else kind of experiencing that kind of thing? I ended up mostly working my title staff remote and the majority of my other staff are coming into the office. So our process would stay pretty steady and normal to what we're used to. Um, I will say I had been advocating for the use of DocuSign with my staff for quite a while and was having the challenge of, you know, what well, it wasn't broken, why should we change? So this has kind of been, a, there's a silver lining in this current scenario for me in that they finally see the value of not having to clean everything uh, the old fashioned way. It was very funny to me. 
once we launch the DocuSign, they, I, to a person, every one of my staff members who's used it has come back to me and said, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. Why haven't we been doing this for years? So um, I try not to say I told you so, but uh, <laughs> Some days I do, um, but yeah, for, for us, because the majority of our staff is still in the office, the other thing that we're noticing in our operation is because we have locked the doors and we're only bringing people inside who have an appointment and have to come inside to sign something, um, we're sort of retraining our client base that a lot of things can be dealt with over the phone or through email, and I think our staff is really liking having fewer walk-ins with random questions that they don't, you know, the, that's not interrupting their day. So. so we were, even if we wanted to have closing staff in, we were, we haven't been able to have much in just because they've all got kids at home. And, I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I would think you're all probably struggling with that too. If you've got, um, if you're in the States where they're stay at home orders, and I think pretty much most everybody is, um, you've got your staff that's got younger children um, trying to work from home and then also homeschool. Tyler, are you seeing much of that in Arizona with your folks? Yeah, and multi-generational families too. You know, some folks have their parents living with them who are high risk. And mm -hmm. so trying to figure out um, you, uh, one individual in the family might come, come in with a fever and, you know, then they were in the office and then now they're not because there's somebody in their household who's showing some COVID symptoms and, and they can be gone for seven to 14 days, depending on how that situation evolves, um, sometimes even longer. Uh, and, and we've got a ton of family, you know, where, where one spouse is, uh, is at home with the kids and another's in the office or they do half days each way. It's, it's very complicated to try and juggle those schedules. Um, and it's, it's fun to, uh, to look at some of the parenting advice articles that come out, how to work from home with your kids and stuff. And uh, I, I've got three-year-old twins and a five-year-old. So I, I worked from home for about uh, seven, 10 days or something um, earlier on when, when we had some fevers around our house. And uh, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> Randy, how about you? What about your staff and how are you handling that from there? Well, one of the answers is is uh, you, you can either stagger the staff, and it's not necessarily – we have really big offices, so frankly, they're so far away from each other. Uh, I'm not as concerned about that. But <clears throat> to the point – to Tyler's point is, is they still have family of their own that they need to help out with uh, their schooling. They need to uh, be on the computers at their house and help out their children. So they also have uh, multi-responsibilities as well. We recognize that. And uh, – I, I think that's the best way we're handling it is by staggering. So Maureen, you mentioned um, that you'd only done one closing uh, with Ron and uh, I kind of wanted to get a feel for, I think you said that you didn't think that the lenders weren't ready or the customers weren't really asking for it. Um, what about uh, Randy? What about you and Tyler? Um, Tyler, I said you're doing a good many Ron closings. If, if you're, is it that you find that the customer doesn't want to do the Ron? Is the lender not quite ready? What is what are the reasons you wouldn't do Ron in the states in y'all states where you can do it? So the main reason we get shut down on Ron is the lender. So part of escrow's yeah, job as they're working through deciding whether or not Ron's going to work on transaction is they have to reach out to the lender with a very specific question. Seller would like to sign the warranty deed using remote online notarization. We need to tell the lender who is signing, what they're signing, and how they're signing it, and get the lender's approval every single time. Um, it, it just doesn't matter what it is and how it's doing. We know that the lenders care about that for whether or not they're going to be able to sell the loan. So that's where we start. And there's maybe a handful, maybe a dozen lenders now that are even saying no to sales side documents. Some of that might have to do with the GSC's requirement to hold on to that video, even on sales side docs for, you know, seven years, life alone, whatever it is. Um, Cause that, that started getting more difficult. Um, and then loan packages, of course, whether or not they're going to allow a hybrid or whether or not they're set up for an e-note and an e-vault um, is complicated. And we have to guide those conversations very carefully to make sure that we've got a notary on the platform to work with the lender so that it all can mesh together. And we kind of knew that was coming um, a, a while back, which is why we didn't just 
pick our favorite vendor and jump with them. We we knew the lenders were going to dictate a lot of these different platforms. And so that's why we're live on three now with two more coming in you know, just a few days away, just so that we can meet the lender. Like have hmm? you got like a checklist or a questionnaire kind of thing that you that you gave to your staff to, so that they yeah. know the check that you first ask this and then you go here? Yeah, and so the order of operations isn't always critical except for that lender question. You want to get that one out of the way first because that's going to uh, um, to torpedo the RON signing, and it's really annoying to get through a RON signing just to find out that they're going to have to go into a, yeah. a, a traditional notary. But yeah, we've got a checklist that you know you need the RON consent. Here's the counties that you can do it in. Initially, not all the counties were accepting these documents. Every county in Arizona e-records. Um, but it's they didn't all come online at the same time. Now they all will accept them. Um, and then same thing with the underwriters. The underwriters have their clear yeses um, and then so that we can work through when we need to go to get special approval on something. Um, so, yeah, lots of checklists for, for escrow. Um, and then the recording desks have started to put together some of their own, making sure that we're on an approved platform using the right uh, notary, making sure that we've got the proper consent from all parties that's specific to the document being signed. Um, so, yeah. That's really helpful. Um, I know that if you're willing to share that, Alta would be very glad to <laughs> disseminate that to anybody who might uh, who might be interested in, in seeing the checklist that you've developed because you you really have gone further into this than probably a lot of folks have just by virtue of being prepared for it earlier on. Randy, um, what about you? Uh, I know you said y'all are you're doing uh, a little bit of Ron. You're allowed to do Ron. What 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 are the obstacles to doing the Ron closings that you see? All right. So uh, to uh, to Tyler's point, I totally agree. The very first question should be, is your lender going to allow it? Because if not, he's right. It kills the deal right there. The very close second, if not tied for first, is do you have a social security number? Because although in the state of Florida, they allow two methods of what's called identity proofing, which is either by biometric reading of your face, like real matrix type stuff, Unfortunately, there isn't a platform around that actually can function and do that. So Florida's passed legislation that's allowed and, and thought about the future. However, the present doesn't allow it. So they need a social security number because what they're really looking for when they're identity proofing the signers is they want to know, uh, they want to be able to match the person with their address, the person with something in their background. And they're not going to be able to do that very well if the person is located in another internationally and they've never been to the United States. Well, how are they going to pull the background information? Because in the identity proofing process, the people are going to have to answer questions about themselves. And if they don't get it right, then they don't move on to the next stage, which is the RON proceeding. So um, there's that. The other thing is, is that, that we've come across, and this is kind of going back to the lender situation, is we did a closing uh, for somebody who was moving to Florida. She was a doctor, an emergency room doctor in Illinois. She was wearing a medical jacket. She was wearing a mask. The mask was just below her chin. She was coughing like mad. And after we did the entire closing, um, she confessed to us that she did have symptoms of COVID-19. She was an emergency room doctor. And uh, not, not, I'm not even done with the story yet. So then we sent them the package, which we already had approval from the lender, uh, which I will share with you as Bank of America this way, you know, because ultimately the conclusion of the story is, is that they said yours is the only one we're ever going, we've ever allowed as a remote online closing. We're just simply not set up for this. And we went back and forth and we showed them the video and we showed them, I said, look, there's no way on earth because it would be tantamount to, hom to, to basically being homicidal for me to put somebody as a notary in the woman's presence right. to have to, because of the physical presence requirement of the notary. And so uh, they agreed to let it go through. But after further discussion, I now understood why it is that some of these lenders are pulling back. And the answer is, is because of the promissory note. What they're concerned about is, is that if the promissory note is digitally signed, what, how, how, do they trans, how, does, how does the bank, the lender, how do they transfer that promissory note? How do they know that it hasn't been assigned, assigned, and assigned 50 more times uh, right after the, uh, the signer signs the promissory note? So then I understood what their concern is. So um, a possibility in the future to answer that is, is you can do your almost a hybrid closing where virtually everything is done. They sign the promissory note. They hold it up to the screen. The screen, everything is recorded. And then they mail it. And then you close once you get the uh, promissory note uh, DHL or FedExed over to you. 
So, so that, that's been my experience. Yeah, there are definitely some issues with it. It's not, you know, I mean, a lot of lenders aren't uh, evolt ready. All those other, all the things that that um, that go into that. It's not as simple as, you know, frankly, we. I think we thought mostly that it was more complicated because of the mortgage document, um, if it had to be notarized, like in my state. Uh, but but really, it is the sellability of the of the loan and, and the promissory note. So there's a lot of logistics that go into that. Um, how are you all finding that your customers are responding to the ways that you're doing different ways, the, the different methods of closing? How what kind of customer responses are you getting, Maureen? What are you seeing uh, with your clients? I would say we're getting 90% of our clients are thrilled that we're giving them the option to sign most of their documents electronically. Um, the ones that have to come in and just sign, maybe, you know, the, the note or the deed and a couple of extra documents that need to be notarized. When we tell them we'll do it in the parking lot, they think that's great. Um, I think this is a terrific time to implement certain changes that maybe you've wanted to have in your practice and hadn't done prior because people are very open to change right now. Everything is in flux, And so there, it's not such a shock when you say, I know you always used to come in and sign face to face at our desk, but we're going to do this over DocuSign. And um, even the people that when they get the DocuSign, they need help. They're calling us. We're walking them through. I would say I can only think of two transactions in the last week where the DocuSign documents, we finally just voided them and said, no, just come on in. And I will say I live in a, a, a county that is uh, my secondary office is in Squim, Washington, which is primarily a retirement community. So the bulk of our clientele are are probably 60 plus. And while we never assume that they're not going to be as computer savvy as a millennial, um, we do definitely have a fair number that just kind of go, well, I don't use the computer. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And so we, it's, we definitely have to up the customer service and handholding to get them through the process. But people are generally just appreciative that we're taking care of their health and, you know, my staff is my family. This company has been in my family since 1982. And some of our staff has been here since 1982. So, I mean, I care deeply about their health and their families um, as well as my client base. So it's been a, a learning experience, but it's been actually overall, our, our customers have been fabulous in accepting of all the changes. I'd say we really have experienced the same thing for the most part. Um, you know, most people have given a lot of grace um, because things are taking longer. Uh, you know, it may take us longer to get funding approval on something just because of the logistics of, you know, getting the packages like I was talking about earlier, getting the packages put back together and sent out for funding. And so funding approval may take us a little bit longer um, with, with folks working remotely. Um, they don't always have immediate access to has the wire hit the, yet. You know, those kind of things that, that are a little bit slower now not being in office. And I'd say, generally speaking, most people have given a good bit of grace and, and are glad, again, saying like you said, Maureen, that we're um, watching out for and taking precautions to keep people safe and, and healthy. Um, have anybody else learned anything else over the, over the last few weeks of having kind of done this and um, changed their process in a, in a way that you think may be sort of a permanent process, a permanent change? Randy or Tyler, have you done any of that, made some changes that you think might you might stick, stay in place, keep in place? So one of the things that we ran into is an issue with time zones. We've got folks all over the world trying to sign their documents remotely online and navigating multiple notary schedules with different time zones, uh, really kind of a struggle. So we did go ahead and implement a, a scheduling tool so that we can send a link to the signer and they can pick a time that's available and it, it references everybody's shared calendar to it. And then, you know, they, they fill out the basic information so that we know they've got the right hardware and uh, they've got information to help us along through the signing. And it adds it back to the notary schedule. It adds it back to the shared schedule. Um, and so it just takes a lot of that back and forth out of the, of the equation and, and it helps a lot with time zones so that you know, they're working in their time zone, we're working in our time zone, 
but it comes together at wherever we're at. Um, so we're definitely keeping that around and we might roll it out to the branches just so, you know, the larger branches could could share that link and they can see the schedules available and, and get scheduled that way. That's great. I think that's a great idea. Um, Randy, how about you? All right. So uh, I kind of put together like a good, bad and the ugly on uh, the remote online notarization. And uh, some of the good is that when it works, it's a dream. It, the, the signers love it because they're in and out. Uh, we don't have expenses for DHL or FedEx because everything is signed virtually and then emailed over. So that's pretty awesome. So we kind of, we save money. I see that there was a question, well, how do you deal with the cost? Well, you know, you, you give up one and then you gain another. So it's, it's almost a break. Um, <clears throat> also, um, the, uh, there's a video that's taken. This is again, part of the good. There's a video taken, it's recorded, it's, it's kept for 10 years in a, uh, uh, under our platform, we use a third party. You're going to have to use a third party. You can't use one of these Zoom companies or, or Skype. You have to use an approved uh, a plat a platform. <laughs> and uh, it, we, we uh, I, I'll share, like Tyler was saying, we also have a script as well. So we have an entire script where we ask, is this knowingly, voluntarily, consensually signed of your own volition, uh, without duress, uh, without free, free of any drugs, alcohols, or anything else impairing your ability to make decisions uh, while you're signing today? <clears throat> so if, uh, if we were ever going to be sued, like for instance, most notaries are not keeping logs. There's no requirements for logs. So uh, if they get pulled into something, no, and somebody's con contest, oh, that wasn't me, that'd be pretty difficult to do when there's a video recording for, ten, for the past 10 years uh, uh, of it. So that's a good thing as well. It's a, it's a lot less liability, in my, in my uh, uh, opinion. And uh, frankly, the, the signers have a one-click option. I mean, if they want to click once and sign everywhere after they've reviewed their documents, it's done. Boom. So that's great. Now, now the bad is is that if you're thinking that this is going to be a plug and play option to just uh, hey, I just purchased my Ron and, and now I'm ready to go. And this ain't a Sega Genesis, man. This is this ain't Sony. This isn't Nintendo. All right, it is not that easy. It takes a while. It is a pain. It is painful every every bit of the way. Um, we already spoke about uh, like Tyler raised. Uh, is the lender even going to accept it? Um, so it, there is a learning curve. It's long to learn. Uh, you're going to have to upload the documents, and uh, which is obviously that that takes a lot longer than just sitting down with somebody pointing to where they should sign. You're going to have to do something called tagging the document. So, for instance, I had a I had a document that was 104 pages long, so with two borrowers, which meant that I'm sitting there tagging the document every place the person has to sign and the other co-borrower has to sign, and uh, and then it glitched, it deleted, and I had to do it again. So that was a bit of a nightmare. So like I said, for the signer, it's a dream. For us, it's a major pain. Um, and then you're going to have to decide. You know, one of the questions was, what about the fee? You're going to have to decide, you know, as a business model, fee versus free. Are you going to charge or are you going to give it away in order to be competitive and put yourself out there as being somebody who offers some value-added service to, uh, especially during this time. During this time, you know, we actually made it onto the good deeds, which I was very proud of. I was, and this was before they were even offering the good deeds. You know, that doctor who had the COVID-19 symptoms, she got me thinking, you know, really, this is something we should be offering right now for free. And frankly, you should be offering it for free because you should be beta testing it right now because you're going to glitch. Um, so it makes it a lot more difficult for people to complain about something that's free. Not saying they won't do it. They'll do it. But it, it makes it a lot more difficult. You also are going to have to, uh, it, at least in some states, at least with us, you have to be separately licensed to be Iran. You have to be separately insured to be a, a run, and I'm talking about above and beyond what a notary is. You have to have separate E&O insurance for it as well. Um, there are other platforms like Notary Cam. Now, when we used them early on, before COVID-19, before the influx, they were amazing. We would send over the documents. They would provide the RON themselves. They would tag up the document. They charged more of a fee for it, but uh, they took all the headache away. Now, because of the backlog, it's very difficult to get through. We almost missed the closing. We had to do it the old-fashioned way. Um, also, you're no longer in the title insurance business when you're doing wrong. Welcome to tech support. You are now in the tech support business. You're going to have to explain to people that, yes, you do need a webcam in order to do an audio, video, uh, remote online notarization. I swear that's happened. You're also going to have to explain to them, yes, you do need internet as well. I swear that has happened as well. So you're all of a sudden you're going to have you are going to have a newfound respect for your IT person because you are going to experience all of these questions 
uh, yourself. And some of them you're just not going to be able to answer. And we've had to throw out another one, another closing that we tagged up all the documents and said, all right, come on down. Um, and um, the other the other thing is, is that, you know, we're so used to with technology, everything being so immediate and fast that people get frustrated really quickly. So if you explain to them early on that, look, this is new for me, it's new technology, uh, if you're, you know, be patient, then I think it's going to go a long way. It's going to be very helpful for you because it's probably just a little, that mouse is only a little click away from, from a, a Facebook or Google review for you. But just remember that as well. So be kind, you're, also, you're being recorded and, and, and go out and have a great closing, experience the pain, but eventually you'll get through it and you'll become good at it. Well, so any, any of you, I know, Maureen, you wouldn't be because you said you've only done one, but are e either you, um, you, Randy or Tyler, doing using Ron for just cash deals, non-lender transactions? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, sense, one right? way that we've come over Much some easier. of the troubles that Randy's mentioned is we've centralized all of the Ron tech into a small group of folks that can specialize in it that notes the platforms in great detail. So when the phone call comes in and says, this is the screen I'm seeing, what's going on? They're familiar with it and, and they can guide them along the way. Um, it, it try to relieve that pressure from the escrow team who are experts at, at their side of the table and what they're right. doing. But it's going to take them a very long time, if ever, to become experts on four different signing platforms to accommodate all the different lenders. Um, yeah, and, yes, cash deals absolutely. Um, those are those are pretty easy for us now. You know, we we generally only have a warranty deed for a seller that needs to be notarized, um, and we uh, as much as possible we ask that the rest of the documents escrow takes care of, just because our notaries are are pretty busy right now. So rather than escrow, uh, rather than the the raw notaries tagging a whole bunch of different stuff, they're just left with a, a deed. And then escrow will will take on the settlement statements and all the rest of the stuff that needs to be just, just signed. So we've got a question about the role that the brokers, the realtors um, uh, participate in the process, and I want to um, give each of you kind of a minute to to address that. I want to you know how we are doing it is obviously they're as involved as they ever were up to the point of the closing, but since we're doing them all drive up. Um, Occasionally, we have a realtor who comes to the parking lot also and sits in their car and waves to their client. But for the most part, they just don't come. Um, the money, if they didn't already, if their companies didn't already um, get wires for their commissions, which we've always encouraged for quite some time, but there were quite a few that didn't. Most of them now have, um, have acquiesced and are now receiving commissions via wire transfer, which is a lot easier on us. And then ours are just set up to automatically email that wire confirmation and signed closing statement to them that they need. Um, anybody else? How are, are you handling the realtors any other way, Maureen? Any anything different you're doing, or is, as far uh, as the participation? Yeah, the, realtor? Yeah. the realtors in our area pretty much don't attend closings, and we have a few that that are pretty religious about it, but the rest of them are saying, no, this is your area and we trust you and, and, you know, our clients are in good hands with you. So that hasn't changed dramatically um, due to the COVID situation. We are now mostly depositing realtor commissions directly to their banks. Um, we don't have to wire because we're in a tiny little town and we just go out and take the deposits to the banks, just like we do for our clients. Um, we have a few real estate offices that still want us to drop the commission checks at their office and they have, you know, maybe a lock box that we're putting them in. And then we just call them and tell them it's there and they go get it. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's pretty much been business as usual. Tyler, what about you in Arizona? We've asked folks that don't need to sign documents to come into our offices. Um, mm -hmm. And most people are very understanding about that. Uh, we've had a couple agents that, for whatever reason, aren't concerned about COVID and, and would like to attend closing and kind of make a stink about it. Um, so it's just really important that we we do our best to make sure that our escrow officers are empowered to, to turn people away when when they're not, when they don't need to be there. If it's not necessary for you to be in our office, you're not coming in. Um, so yeah, in the beginning, I think we had a few in the early hard, stages. Yeah, there's been some hard conversations, but by and large, the realtors don't want to come into our office anyway. So they're, 
they're, they're as happy as not just to uh, to have an excuse not to attend. <laughs> well, and yeah. one of the things that we always let them know is if you want to attend via phone, we'll right. happily put you on your phone and you can hear everything. You can interject, you know, and I haven't had anyone take us up on that. But I always make I sure that anybody pick us up on joining the wrong signing. I, we offer it up to the escrow officers to join in, the loan officers, the realtors. Um, and I think I've had two loan officers sit in on a signing. And they were mostly just interested in seeing how the platform worked rather than actually meeting the customer. Uh, so, oh. Randy, what about you? I so it's pretty much the same. We have the ability to allow uh, anyone to join in uh, to the remote online notarization that's uh, being conducted via audio video. However, um, nobody's really requested it. Frankly, it would be pretty quick to begin with. Mm -hmm. And I, I, yeah. I would really propose to realtors that are looking to make the impression because that's really what it's about. It's about to them. It's about the customer service. You know, we, we wire we offer to wire their funds in uh, always. It's, like you say, it's easier for us as well to just wire their money. But <clears throat> to me, the best bang for their buck would be to actually meet the people who they represented out at the house or whatever property it is and uh, do that face-to-face -face time within six feet uh, and um, make that appearance, not necessarily at a table. I mean, that's, there's, not, there's no hand-holding. There's nothing to really say. There's nothing for them to do. Um, but you know, show them that you care. Yeah, I yeah, I would I think so too. Um, so the next question I see on our chat uh, is: Are Zoom or Google Hangouts appropriate places for watching remotely to notarize? With both, I know I can send a private link to parties involved. Is that enough? I, I'm I'm assuming the question's talking about Ren, um, and you know we can't do that in our state. Uh, I think s several of y'all said you can't do it in your states either. Um, you know, I, I would think that the, really the question is back to the lender as to if if you're in a state that permits REN um, and the and you want to do that, I would think that the question would go back to the lender as to whether or not they're and your title insurance company as to whether or not mm -hmm. the title company will insure and whether the lender will accept documents that are right. notarized using those kind of platforms. Anybody else have anything else to add to that? I, I think it really depends upon the, I think it depends upon the state, not, not necessarily the lender or the, uh, or the title company. It, is it allowed, first of all? And for us, sure. it's either, you have two options. It's either one, the, the person's physically present so that you can notarize the documents, or two, you're doing it under the approved uh, statutory method that's been employed and been, you know, where great pains has been taken to draft those uh, statutes to say how it has to be done. And you have to do it on the approved platforms for which uh, Zoom and Google are definitely not. I mean, it has to be reported. Sure. They have to have the, the identity proofing. They have to have uh, all, the, all these different additional safeguards um, that Zoom and Google just simply do not have. Absolutely. But I do think the question was probably coming from somebody who may be in a state. I mean, there are quite a few states that have either by executive, well, mostly by executive order, I guess, um, are permitting REN. So, um, you know, I, I think in the event of a state that permits REN, th then the question is to the lender and to the title insurance company as to whether, you know, they would permit what platforms they would permit um, the use of REN. Because I don't, you know, I mean, it, it it definitely for those of us who've worked on Ron for so long, um, the concept of Ren is scary, frankly to me, um, just because you don't have all the you don't have the KBA, the credential analysis, all those things that that we know about the video, audio, video recording of it, and all of that that we um, know is involved in the Ron. So it's um, scary, a little bit scary to me, but it's a I guess another means to get business done. Um, yeah, we're coming up on the time. Um, what do you What do y'all think is going to happen when the stay at home orders end? How do you envision um, kind of getting back to normal or whatever normal is, Tyler? What do I think when it's going to end? I, I I think there's going to be a very slow return to normal. I think a lot of our folks that are working at home will continue to work from home. 
Uh, I think Ron is going to continue to become more and more popular over time as lenders figure out a way to adopt. Um, the lenders that have already found ways to adopt have started pushing it pretty heavily. Uh, and I, I just can't imagine that in the next six months, folks are going to be going back to where we were three months ago. I just don't think that's going to happen um, with most of any of it. Yeah, I don't know either um, as far as how long it will take. Um, uh, Maureen, I think you mentioned that your title folks were were working remotely and that you may um, kind of keep that in place for a while. Oh, I actually don't foresee letting go of any of the changes we've made. I think that our client base appreciates options, and I think all of the options we've come up with, and we should have maybe the parking lot signings um, that might disappear. My hope is that will disappear as we are more able to do Ron. Um, but I definitely like having some of my staff remote and whether it becomes a permanent fixture for certain roles or whether it becomes a thing where people can, you know, work from home part of the time and in the office part of the time, we've all kind of enjoyed having a little more space. Um, and this is just proven. I mean, it's been bumpy because of the speed at which we had to implement the, the right. remote workers. But as we've figured out where the technology glitches were for us, it's starting to work really well. And I know several of my employees absolutely love working from home. And so I don't think that's going to change. Randy, what about you? So <clears throat> post COVID-19, when everything starts opening up, I anticipate that uh, we are going to go back to doing the e what's easiest for us, which is just simply having somebody show up at our office and physically stamp and notarize documents. Plus, uh, with doing things via Ron, we lose one of our sales point. We have a beautiful million dollar penthouse that we have people come to. And we showcase this with art all over the place. This is how uh, we like to make an impression. We can't make that impression just via a piece of glass uh, on, on a laptop and a webcam. Um, now, what we will push, however, and uh, what I, I like what Tyler said the other day, which is we're just giving you options. You now have more options. You have the curbside, which you're like, great, so why would you ever do that again? But uh, uh, so, <clears throat> you, but now you've got the Ron, you've got the physical, and uh, you, you've got now, now you have options. So, uh, but who we will push it for are the foreign buyers. Now, I don't mean international. Like I said, you have to have a social security number in order to do, to do the Ron for us. So <clears throat> what do I mean? I mean, like the somebody, who, the, the person who's in New York, the person who's in Illinois, in Illinois, whoever, wherever they are in the, in the United States or, or out of the country, they can, they can do this remote online notarization anywhere. Um, right. So that, that's great for them. And so we will, we will certainly push it for them. Um, but it's 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 important when you got to, when you're in business you you have to put out everything. And I love that I, you know I've I've been a proponent in my state for us to implement Ron and we don't have it yet. Um, but for that very reason, I think being able to give options um, is a good thing. And we certainly have a lot of buyers uh, out of state buyers, um, which would be much and even out of the country because we have a lot of military folks um, in our state. So it would be a lot. It would be very nice to have options um, that were more convenient for the consumer than what we currently can offer. But I would say, similar to you, Randy, we um, we do some interesting things at closing, particularly for first time home buyers, to really sort of celebrate um, the consumer and their um, you know their purchase. And it's exciting, and we try to make it exciting. And so, um, closing I did this morning. Of course, I was on the phone with the buyer. Their first time home buyers. And it was a first and a second, and it was kind of a little bit messy. Um, but we were laughing and joking. And I said, I, I hate that you can't come in because we really try to have a have a fun with it and and celebrate the fact that you're a first time home buyer and it's exciting. And they said, Oh yeah, you know that's cool. We we really appreciate that. And they were like, Well, next time we buy a house, you know that, that kind of thing. But that's been a little bit of a bummer not to be able to do those kinds of things. Um, but I, I would like to have. Um, some different options for those who don't necessarily need to come in or can't come in, or, you know, for whatever reason. Um, okay, so we're into the Q&A session, and um, we've got a question here 
about POAs. So um, someone's asking if anyone's done closings with POAs. I mean, I think we do closings with POAs a good bit, but probably so the question really is, are you doing POAs like with the real estate agent holding the seller's POA? Has anybody done anything like that? Tyler, you're with your Ron, you're probably not really having to do as much of that. But what about um, Randy, Maureen, are you, are you doing those kind of things? We have not had to do that at this point. We've been able to work with our clients. Um, and yeah, that we've had a couple of clients get POAs for their parents who are maybe in assisted living in lockdown. I think that's the only time I've, I've had to deal with that lately. Randy, what about you? Nothing out of the ordinary. They just yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. We have, I mean, we've done POAs. I've got, I'm doing one in just a few minutes, um, but it's a military husband giving POA to his wife, you know, so we, we're still seeing that. I haven't seen, um, at least during COVID, I haven't seen um, a real estate agent POA. I've certainly seen it and it happens from time to time, but I haven't seen it. Um, I certainly haven't seen the instance of that increase. Um, I feel like okay, that might be California thing. I think that that may have become an, more of an issue in California um, with actually with the escrow people being asked to have POAs for the, and just sign. But, well, we know that Freddie and Fannie have relaxed their guidance on that, um, but I know there's still a lot of agents that are that are concerned about um, the escrow officers or um, or closing agents or you know whatever you call them in your state. Um, being the POA, we have not been asked to do that. Um, and we in South Carolina as lawyers, um, have, we don't love to do that for clients. In fact, I can't think of a time that we've done that other than for like builder clients or, you know, clients like that, that we, we work with on a regular basis. And it's really not a POA. It's more of a corporate resolution authors, you know, authorizing signature. But for the most part, we don't do that for consumer clients and feel a little bit uncomfortable about it. Um, okay, we've got another question here as we get close to wrapping up. Um, what impact on the small agency do you foresee having to have multiple RON providers? Um, most agencies don't have tech departments, let alone a team dedicated to learning and implementing RON. So, Tyler, to your point about having dedicated staff to that, um, you know, the question, of course, about small business owners um how how do you think they'll handle that um and maybe both randy well maureen let me ask mm -hmm. you because you're a small company how many providers do you have now um, i am currently on with pavasso and then i actually used notary cam for the one run that we've done so far and you know again we're less than a month into even being able to do run and so I am still, you know, getting my feet wet. I'm loving all the information from from everyone in this uh, panel today because it, I've been taking notes while everyone else is talking about their experiences. But I think it's very similar in my mind to the fact that we have to deal with every lender's platform, you know, for for handling the loan documents. I kind of expect that we're going to have to learn you know, multiple RON platforms. My intention is to actually identify one person in each of my escrow teams that becomes the RON specialist. And to out of the gate, my plan was mostly to use notary cam because to, uh, I think Tyler's point and, and Randy, I think mentioned it as well. We can actually have them do the RON signing um, and do the, the tagging, but I also know that right now they're very swamped, so I haven't, I haven't been trying to get into that um, right now. But that's, I mean, as a, you know, I have 25 employees, I have two offices, I'm in one county, I understand that concern of, ugh, I have to learn all these different platforms. I do have a dedicated IT person on staff, but he also won't run all the rest of our IT. So I know this is going to fall largely on my author department. So we've got a couple of more questions, but before we do that, I'd like to um, show one final message from our sponsor, Amtrust. In the world of real estate development, 
Stakes are high. There's no room for error. Uh-oh. Looks like something is missing. And the title insurance company isn't ready to close. You need a partner who covers every angle. You need Amtrust Title. 23 million dollars surplus and thanks to reinsurance from Big Brother and Trust International Insurance with over 2 billion in surplus capital that's half of the four biggest industry players combined Amtrust title has a single policy limit of 525 million dollars it's all there on the struck special bulletin all types of real estate transactions problems are solved even before you discover them gotcha Hit it! And trust title. Thanks very much to all of our sponsors um, for their uh, sponsorship of today's webinar. Um, Tyler, you had something you wanted to tack on to with regard to the question that uh, the Marine was addressing right before the video. Sure. I, so we have right now sort of taken the lead on this at Pioneer. Um, but I don't think it's some kind of huge competitive advantage, and I don't think it's something that small agents necessarily need to be overwhelmed with. Uh, we are seeing a bunch of notaries here in Arizona um, signing up on different platforms, going in and getting their IPEN and RON certifications with the Secretary of State. And I've talked to quite a few of the different national notary providers, and they are working on, on being able to earmark the different notaries to the different platforms to help us and agents navigate that those situations so i don't think it's going to be very long um at least here in arizona for the other agents to to be able to go to one of those providers and say hey i need a pavaso notary to do a loan package at four and it will be very similar to, to scheduling and signing your other mobile notaries just with you know a, a few tweaks added into it you won't have some of the benefits that we're going to have for with the on-staff notaries um but the cost to your bottom line probably won't be that different. It's not cheap having these people um, be trained on these different platforms. And, and it's not a very big cost savings having other people do it as compared to having somebody else do it. Um, so I think give it time and maybe start looking now for those notaries. And I, I would imagine you'll, you'll find them pretty quickly um, in, in states that are live with it. Great. Um We've got a couple more questions. The next one is, have, have any of us experienced a slowdown in productivity and communication concerns for those working from home? Um, and I would say for me, yes, I have. Um, you know, fair amount of my staff is dealing with home, trying to homeschool their children at the same time. And so there are times when um, even in the middle of the day or whatever, they're having, I know that they're having to stop and go handle something um, with their child. Um, and so, yes, we have definitely experienced that. And we've just, we have automatic email responses that go out for everybody that say working from home. Um, I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can, just so that anybody who sends an email to them knows that, that that's what's going on. Um, and we've, you know, asked for, again, for some grace for people just because everybody's dealing with this. Um, and so um, we've, we've certainly asked about that, but um, Tyler, uh, how about you or Randy? I'm sorry, I was meant to jump to Randy because you had we had talked about remote uh, folks. Um, Randy, have you experienced any issues with that? Well, of course. I mean, if their attention isn't 100 percent, then uh, anything that detracts from it is going to affect productivity. So I, I don't think anything more needs to be said on that. Question is, is how do you handle that? And uh, you either accept it or you have a conversation with that employee and address right. it straight on. Don't let it uh, curb it before it gets worse. All right, next, the last question I think we've got, because uh, we've just got a few more minutes left here. Um, are any of us seeing uh, lenders, and I bet you, um, Tyler and Randy, you both can uh, say this, but are any of you seeing lenders who are not yet approved to offer um, e-mortgages or e-notes more interested are there conversations happening now about that happening um uh that they're now trying to get approved for that kind of thing yeah i get a lot of calls from lenders smaller local credit unions regional banks 
um, trying to figure out what the possible options are. And they're really starting at ground zero. Some of them don't even realize they can't just slap a signature on a note and call it an Eno. Um, I really liked that blog article the other day. Uh, so it was great. It really was. Lots of those conversations over the last couple of weeks of, you know, what, what we're able to facilitate. Um, and I give them the options that I see some of the other l- lenders doing uh, and really just try and reinforce that I'm not an expert on you getting your loan sold. I, I'm, I, I know what we can ensure. I know what our capabilities are. Here's what we can do. Um, and then try and let them figure out, you know, some of the specifics around what's going to happen. Because even on a hybrid, there's some interesting uh, uh, little questions. Um, you know, does that note, if you're going to wet sign the note, do they want it on camera? Do you, are they going to require it back prior to funding? And all of that depends on the lender and the relationship with the customer um, and just the, the, the whole process behind it. So lots of those conversations happening. Great. So thanks very much to all of our panelists and thanks for having me on today as your host and moderator. Um, I'm going to throw it to Steve Gottheim. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. And thank you again to all of our panelists and to again to our featured webinar sponsor, Old Republic National Title Insurance Company, and all of our other Alta Advocacy Summit sponsors for helping us bring you this important and timely content.